which means, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know we saw many of you a few weeks ago, but if you didn't catch that episode of Posters and Cocktails, you can check it out on our Vimeo page where we, all of our virtual programming is recorded. Of course, if you haven't attended an event with me before, I'm Angeline Lippert, the chief curator of Poster House, which is the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Um, as always, we've kept our online programming free thanks to crazy poster people like you uh, who allow us to pay our speakers through donations. And tonight, as I said I was going to do, thanks to a generous sponsorship by Don Leibowitz and Claudia Wagner, we are able to bring you another installment of Posters and Cocktails. And tonight's theme is a continuation of the previous episode's topic, American Travel Posters Part Deux. Uh, now, if you haven't been to a Posters and Cocktails before, you might want to know we're a little funny, a little flirty, and definitely a workplace liability. Um, I'm also joined tonight by my two favorite men, Nicholas Lowry of Swan Auction Galleries and Don Spiro of the Green Fairy Society. As always, Don will start us off with an all-American beverage, and then we'll head west with Nico onto a manifest destiny of poster delights. Uh, and we'll go back and forth like that until the jokes get really unbearable. And we finished about four cocktails. And if you do not have the ingredients, um, I suggest doing shots every time Nico talks about his recent moose sighting in Alaska. Uh, now, meanwhile, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I will vocalize them to the boys as we go. And if you need closed captioning, there is a CC button in the lower portion of your screen. Uh, and now Don. What is our first cocktail for the evening and its relevant city? Well, our first cocktail of the evening, uh, you'll be able to tell what city it's from very easily. It's called a Chicago cocktail. Uh, so, of course, it, it is from Des Moines. No, it is from Chicago. And it's basically a, a variation of what you would call the fancy cocktail. It's a cocktail dating back to the 1860s that has brandy, sugar, bitters, and uh, curacao or absinthe as variations. Um, I love researching these things and, and going down the rabbit hole. And uh, fortunately, I found in one of my cookbooks that has a, a bit of uh, cocktail, uh, how to serve it, actually mentions a, a fancy brandy cocktail, to de quick describe it, um, into a bar glass of shaved ice, put two dashes of Boker's or Angostura bitters, gum syrup, maraschino, absinthe, uh, and a wine glass of brandy, yep. garnished with like a lemon peel. Now, what's great about this is that this actually dates back to 1904. And surprise me, it's um, written by Christine Terhune Herrick and Marion Harland. So it's a 1904 cocktail recipe book done by two ladies, which is, is um, I didn't realize I had that. So I'm very happy to do that. and announce that here on, on the show that that exists. So uh, Harry Johnson's bartender manual, 1882, uh, changes the recipe a little bit, adds some champagne. He says it's a squirt of champagne and then specifies that the champagne has to be on draft. Uh, they had champagne on draft back then. So how to go from a fancy brandy cocktail to a Chicago cocktail? This guy, Cocktails, How to Mix Them, Robert Vermeer, uh, 1922, includes the Chicago cocktail, which he describes as a fancy brandy cocktail, uh, a plain brandy cocktail with a little champagne on top. His version, though, uh, had sugar around the rim. So we're, I, I generally don't like things too sweet, but you're welcome to try that variation if you want. Just moisten uh, the rim with some lemon and put it in some pulverized uh, powdered sugar. Uh, pulverized sugar or super fine sugar. Uh, I, I think that powdered sugar actually has um, uh, cornstarch and you won't be able to do that. So finally, Harry Craddock's Savoy Cocktail Book, 1930, says to shake it and strain it into a cocktail glass. Well, we're going to stir it because it, it seems to me like it's going to be a stirred cocktail. So what we're going to do is add two ounces of brandy and the Chicago cocktail is actually quite nice. Uh, Chicago restaurant critic uh, John Dury, Drury uh, had it in his 1931 guide, Dining in Chicago. So that's what really made it famous. So two ounces, and we're going to put it not in this glass, but into a bar glass. 
not going to build it in a cocktail glass. So one ounce, boom, two right there. Then we're going to add a dash of aromatic bitters. Got Angostura right here. So that's a dash. Then it says a dash or a quarter ounce of curacao, orange liqueur. I'm using curacao orange liqueur. If you don't have curacao and you want to try a different orange liqueur, be my guest. One of the great things about all these cocktail recipes is when bartenders ran out of uh, something or they couldn't get something, they tried something else and the recipe changed. So that's it. Then stir in a mixing glass with ice and strain. So I'm gonna add some ice. Just my fingers. There we go. All my ice melted while it was on the counter. Must be very warm where you are. Yes. Yeah. It's been a hot day. So there we go. Now, strain it into your cocktail glass. Uh, this has been out for demonstration purposes, but if you get a chance to chill your cocktail glasses, even so much the better. There we go. And of course it doesn't fill it. Why doesn't it fill it? Well, because we need to um, top it with some champagne. And I've got a bottle here of actually Prosecco. There we go. And just pour it right in. And that. But in the ingredient list you gave us, there's no champagne on that list. Oh, did I leave the champagne out? Yeah. Oh, my. Mm. Well, I apologize for that. It's, it's good either way. Without yeah, the, this is with pretty awesome. Champagne. Um, yeah. Anna in the chat wants to know what your preferred cognac is. Um, for mixing. Um, let's see, uh, Lustau, I'd say, was it Lustau? Not Lustau, um, that's Sherry. Um, well, right now I've been using a uh, California one, actually, um, Berto, which is quite good for mixing. Uh, I, I've used, um, let's see, Hennessy was uh, quite good for mixing. Um, sometimes I use Remy Martin, uh, although I really like that in a coffee. Um, I'd say for your cognac is a, is a matter of taste. I am um, not as big a fan of cognac as I am of something very similar, uh, Armagnac, um, which is just, just a different region. It's pretty much the same, but a different region. Uh, anyway, that's the Chicago cocktail. And I apologize for leaving out the, the champagne. And back to you, Nico. I mean, delicious as always, Don. And uh, three things. I, I heard that whole presentation once, as always, jealous that I can't mix anything. The two things that stick in my mind are a little squirt of something. I'm not even sure what's the little squirt of anything makes any cocktail better. And then the fact that there was champagne on tap. Uh, oh, that's yes. just extraordinary to me. I would love to find an establishment with draft champagne. Back in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a time capsule or something. And the third thing, which is just astounding to me, is that of all the people who tune into this lecture, I would expect this is the um, demographic that would just have a handy bottle of champagne kicking around the house. So even though it was left off the ingredient list, I don't really think it's a problem. No, I, have, I just don't want to open a bottle of champagne. For... Right. Oh, I always recommend if you're making cocktails that involve champagne, it's not a big party, mini bottles. I've got, I've got like a six pack in the fridge for <laughs> any occasion. I'm a size queen. All my things are full-sized. <laughs> nice. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here. Are you guys ready to go? We, oh, we see Chicago. Let me get, oh, let's hang on. I have uh, a couple extra windows open here, like the chat window won't go away. Let me get the chat window away. Boom. I, Boom. See, I see the peristyle. There's the peristyle. All right, so we are going to begin uh, where Don left us uh, with Chicago, and we're going to go... Um, chronologically. Uh, I should ask any of our guests tonight uh, from Chicago, uh, because if you're from Chicago and you're tuned in tonight, uh, I apologize for any geographic mistakes I might make or erroneous assumptions on, um, 
on layout or buildings. Uh, I've been to Chicago a number of times. I love Chicago. I'm not as familiar with Chicago as I am with New York. Um, every time I've been to Chicago, I've never seen the peristyle, which is uh, a real feature in the Chicago uh, sort of skyline. Psych, uh, the peristyle uh, hasn't been around since 1953, but it was a very important part of the Chicago skyline. This poster from uh, 1921 is by Irvine Metzel, one of the great series uh, of posters for the elevated lines uh, in Chicago, the, the subway, basically. Uh, there was also a great series for the North Shore Line and the South Shore Line, uh, railroad lines. This is uh, just, a, just a fantastically evocative and moody image. Those of you who know the work of Ludwig Holwein or the Beggerstaff brothers will recognize the style here. Uh, simply great. Uh, and uh, those of you who are not familiar with where the peristyle was, uh, it used to sit at the north end of Grant Park, which is today Wrigley Square. What well, perhaps the, the most famous uh, museum in America, certainly one of the best is the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, this poster is by a very uh, well-known artist named Willard Frederick Elms, who might recognize his name from the Mather Work Incentive poster series, which is also based out of Chicago. Uh, he did this also for the elevated lines in 1924. Just take a look at artistically how this is achieved, where the museum sort of appears out of the solid blue background of the dusk. Um, you don't see any real black outlining on the building. It just is, it's sort of there, but you, you recognize the building right away by the lion, uh, one of the two lions in the front of the um, of the museum. And then we go to uh, 1925. This is a poster designed for the Illinois Central Railway by an illustrator named Paul Prohl. Uh, if it looks like a magazine illustration, it's because he was an illustrator. Uh, this really, uh, Don, I think you'd appreciate the sort of sheer Art Deco fabulousness of this with these two women uh, outfitted for a wonderful day of shopping, probably on Michigan Avenue. There's the street traffic behind them. Uh, both both car and pedestrian, and then the wonderful uh, skyline in the background. I love how they're holding their hats in the wind. <laughs> yes, well, that's, you know, the windy city and all. <laughs> uh, and then uh, again by Paul Prohl, this uh, circa 1929. I love this poster uh, because, uh, you know, obviously it's the, the Chicago shoreline, uh, but it reminds me so much of French travel posters from the same era, especially the work of Roger Broders, who basically in every single travel poster he designed for a French Riviera resort had a curved shoreline like this on the oh. bay. Um, and I, you know, one or two he did also with women with umbrellas. So I don't know specifically um, who copied whom on this, but I would have to imagine that Broders uh, was first and Prohl was a well-read illustrator and um, adopted this I, I literally, I was giving a tour for the blind earlier and I used the, the Brewers Antibes that has this, this conceit in it, so, yeah. I see. See what I did there? Oh. All right. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned the South Shore Line posters. So this poster uh, by Otto Brenneman from 1926 uh, is advertising travel to a Notre Dame football game, which I think is just, a, it's wonderful. So it is not showing Chicago, but it is by all means uh, a Chicago poster. And obviously from a poster collecting point of view, a lot of people go really crazy uh, about sports images. And that is as good a sport image as you could hope to have. Uh, arguably, I should have put this um, right with the other one. Here's the peristyle again. Uh, in Grant Park, Wrigley Park. Um, this is, do uh, you recognize the artist? This artist did a lot of very famous posters. Leslie Reagan, uh, working for the New York Central Lines here in 1929. Uh, it was the first poster he designed for the railway, uh, curiously, that traveled to Chicago. It's got the, the Miracle Mile right there, I believe. Uh, and it's this sort of combination of nature and architecture. Look at the, they're not, uh, storm clouds above the city, but they're such dramatic clouds. Uh, and in the foreground, you see this young woman and the birds flying, um, just an amazing, amazing image. And uh, Leslie Reagan was such an accomplished artist. He's most well known um, 
for a piece we're going to see later on in the presentation for the 20th Century Limited, which was the sort of signature streamlined train for the New York uh, Central Lines. Uh, Chicago was also home to a World's Fair in 1933. Uh, this is by Hernando G. Villa. Um, really sort of curious conceit uh, for the World's Fair with a, with a young uh, laurel wearing man holding up Chicago on a tray, uh, a map of the world in the background and sort of a star right on Chicago. You can sort of see it there right by his right elbow almost, but uh, it's a great poster. It's, it's not the most obvious allegory in the world, um, but a, certainly a wonderful Chicago poster. And as we get later on uh, into the into the century here, we've got circa, uh, not circa, this is 1957, uh, sort of a similar view that we've seen already here, one of the lines outside of the Art Institute and a view of the skyscrapers. This is where I embarrass myself. Is that Michigan Avenue that runs in front of the Art Institute there? Are we looking down? Uh, yes, south, uh, north, up South Michigan Avenue is what it is. Um, We've got the Wrigley Building and the Tribune Tower in the background. Again, this is 1957. The, the um, fashions are very different, Don, from the 1920s, mm -hmm. but you get a sort of a, a fairly nice feeling for them by looking at the people on the street here. Ooh. Uh, now we have uh, United Airlines circa 1954. Never uh, seen this one. Ah, you know, stick with me, kid. Uh, William Lawson, he did a series for United Airlines. I think we've seen other ones uh, in the string of presentations. How many have we done of these, by the way? Posters and cocktails or of Americana? Posters and cocktails. I know we've done two of oh, them. Probably, a, probably a, at least a dozen, maybe more. I mean, we started in the pandemic. You know, I'm glad you can't remember because that means you won't remember if I'm rehashing images. Uh, it's clearly, I didn't rehash this image, uh, but we have seen others in the series. Anyway, this is the um, Water Tower, the Palmolive, and the Palmolive Building. Again, traffic along North Michigan Avenue here. Oh. Uh, a great architectural image, um, and uh, you've got the plane uh, at the top and, and the searchlight on top of the building, just lovely. And one of the things that Chicago is is really well known for is its modernist architecture, including buildings by Mies van der Rohe. And here you have uh, uh, a sliver of Lake Michigan seen between uh, the two towers of van der Rohe's uh, Lakeshore Drive glass house apartment buildings. They were built in 1951, this poster was soon thereafter, but it's it's just lovely where you have the sort of the hyper-modern buildings. Uh, you see those cars on the street there at the bottom, and then you have all the people on the beach swimming in the city. Basically, one of the few major cities in America, I think, that has a beach right downtown. Hmm. Everybody tuning in from Los Angeles will have issues with that, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so another wonderful poster um, the thing about this poster that strikes me as the most interesting is that there is no uh, attributed artist. It's an anonymous poster, and it's unusual to me because I think this is just a really accomplished image, and it probably doesn't show that well on your screen, but uh, these are very twilight shades of purple, and it's a beautiful image. Um, I've referred to it as a spectacularly colored dusk scene. Uh, that's the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and you've got the Wrigley Building and the Tribune Tower uh, in the background. Um, we'll see some more of Chicago's rivers uh, in a second. Another beautiful modernist design. Modernist is that, is that Stan Galley? Uh, no, it is not Stan Galley. It but is, it looks like Stan Galley. It may look like Stan Galley, but Tom Hoyne would be very disappointed to know that you were mistaking his art for Stan Galley's art. Or was but, Tom copying Stan? Uh, Angelina, do you recognize those buildings? I've I've been by them in the like riverboat tour, but I. I, I That's don't. the swizzle stick you have. Oh, oh my God, you're right. I was showing Don my my parents' collection of swizzle sticks from the '70s that I keep in my house for no apparent reason. But you're right; they are those. Well, now we have to see them. I know I have to find a collection of like 200 swizzle sticks. I, I'll get back <laughs> to you at, at the I'll, at the break. At the break. At the break. I'll you you dig through your swizzle sticks. Um, you 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 finger those sticks, and I will carry on. This is the, it's called Marina City, designed by Bertrand Goldberg. Um, it's interesting, we don't really have an exact date for this poster, but the, but the buildings were built between 1963 and 1967. So I think it's safe to assume that this poster is sort of mid to late 1960s. Love that uh, the couple in the foreground are both wearing sunglasses. <laughs> it's great, uh, a really a cute little... Um, 
Wait, what's, what's the name of the building? Because I found the stick. Marina City. Oh, the, oh, the swizzle stick says Continental. Oh, no, Continental to Chicago. Never mind, that's an airline. Okay, carrying on. So uh, another really famous artist who did work for uh, designing uh, posters for Chicago also did a series for United Airlines is Joseph Binder. Uh, he designed, I believe, uh, seven or eight different posters, New York, Colorado, the Northwest, the, the Pacific Northwest, California, San Francisco, and so on. Again, we have Michigan Avenue here. Again, we have the Lions, obviously a very popular view. Uh, this poster is 1957, but you don't really get a great feel for the fashions on the street, except for that one guy sort of right beneath the lion's belly who looks like the man from Uncle in the gray <laughs> suit and the thin black tie, which I think is absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, I put this one in just to know, to show you that everyone was doing posters. This is Greyhound Bus, 1958, uh, Chicago at night. You've got the Tribune building there all lit up. Um, and then uh, Austin Briggs, not a particularly famous artist, but a sort of another dusk scene here, uh, a view out towards Lake Michigan uh, with some of the bridges there along the Chicago River. And the final one, Don, before I kick it back to you, uh, this is really... Wow. To be fair, not exactly a travel poster. And I think this has come up, uh, Angelina. Well, Maybe in I love that poster. Chats. John Massey, uh, who did designs for Noel as well. Um, just a great image uh, to promote the city. And it's sort of the hi highlights of the city in its most simple, simplified geometric forms. The triangles for the boats on the lake and the circle for the sun, I guess, or perhaps the moon. Uh, evocative, simple, straight to the point, uh, and powerful, very much like Chicago itself. And with that, I will pass it back over to you, Don, until the next tranche. Thank you, Nico. That was fantastic. Oh, I'm looking over at- uh, I found Andrew. the swizzle stick. Yeah, that's it. That's the, that's the poster. I had no idea. The Marina Towers. I, I have hundreds of these things from my parents. Well, I'm Marie, also wearing Marie, 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 the, Marina City. Well, the, but they are Marina Towers. Let's see. Anyway, that's fantastic. And that Don is so intimate with your swizzle stick collection is the point of a little bit of jealousy on my behalf, but I'll, I'll survive. You're not the only man in my life. I'm also wearing all of my grandfather's uh, trucker caps that represent Americana throughout the night. So then we have cat. Uh, go, go Don, go. Ah, very good. I'm, I'm also, I guess, in, in red, white, and blue uh, by happenstance. Um, our next cocktail is uh, one that I always like. Is It's a small cocktail. Um, and if you've been to posters and cocktails before, you know that there's a history of naming cocktails after famous people or events or places, you know, locations. So what is now the state of Alaska was officially incorporated into the United States as a territory in 1912. And one year later, it was incorporated into a uh, name of a cocktail in this book, Jock Straub's Manual of Mixed Drinks. So it goes back to 1913. Some people say, oh, well, why is it named the Alaska cocktail? Was it invented there? Well, my guess is, and, and other people's guesses, is, is that it's because Alaska was a new territory. So originally made with Old Tom Gin, which is a sweeter gin at a two to one ratio with yellow chartreuse. Um, that to me is a little sweet. Uh, 1931, 30, uh, Harry Craddock Savoy cocktail book changes the ratio from two to one to three to one and makes it a dry gin. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to get our mixing glass. I'm going to be adding an ounce and a half of gin. Wow. Again, I'm, I'm just showing you the wrong glass. <laughs> In fact, what I'm going to do is do a little more for me. Um, so an ounce and a half of gin to a half ounce of yellow chartreuse. So it's even going to be like a four to one. So we've got some yellow chartreuse. Uh, chartreuse comes in two kinds, basically. There's the green chartreuse and the yellow chartreuse. And the green is a little more, I would say, like anise and herbal and uh, higher proof. It's got more of a punch. Uh, this is 40 ABV and it's, it's slightly sweeter, mellow. There we go. 
So we're going to add a half ounce of this. There we go. Dash of orange bitters. And then we're going to add some ice. I'm going to bring the ice up higher so I don't spill it on the floor of the diet. There we go. Give it a bit of a stir. Just dilute it a little bit. It doesn't just chill it. The, the dilution of the water uh, helps blend all the ingredients together. We do have a question. What gin are you using and why do you prefer it for this cocktail? Oh, this I like uh, a dry gin for this cocktail. And the one I'm happening to use, I, I generally use um, Bee Feeder, which is a, a little heavier, or um, Gordon's right now. I've got Dorothy Parker Gin. It's a New York gin. We're, we're traveling through America, so I'm using uh, a gin that is actually made in Brooklyn. And they have this, and they have Perry's Top, which is their uh, Navy strength. They're in the process of moving the distillery, by the way. Um, but it's, it's a terrific distillery, and they make a, a terrific product. What's it, what is, this is Navy strength. Navy strength is uh, uh, 114 proof. It's it's a higher proof than the uh, the 80 proof we usually have. And actually, this Dorothy Parker is 44%. So it's 88 proof. So then the only other thing we're going to do for this is garnish it with a uh, a lemon twist. I'm going to cut one right there. I'm going to say, don't try it with green chartreuse, kids. It's uh, not as good. Not as good. Not as good. So let's press that on the top. And uh, sometimes I like to put it in. So there we go. And well, I have to say with yellow chartreuse, it is a winner. So it's a very, very tasty cocktail for me. And it's something that you don't really find much on, on bar menus anymore. So. Cheers to the Alaska cocktail and Alaska being a state. Back to you, Nika. You know, I actually just got back from Alaska. Sounds like- How I'm many afraid. moose did you see? So I saw one moose shot, two moose shot, three moose, three shots. Have uh, you had your shots, Angelina? Uh, not yet, but I'm working on it. Um, no, so I was in I was in Alaska. So the fact that we're doing Alaskan posters, which is really a coincidence because we came up with this idea long before I left on my trip, uh, is very exciting to me. Um, and um, I can add some personal notes uh, for all of this. Can you guys see my screen now? We can. Excellent. Uh, so we're in Alaska, and uh, we are going to begin in the the sort of 1930s here with the Alaska Steamship Company. And I have to say, I, I've only been on two cruises before in my life. And on both cruises, I was working. I was lecturing on travel posters and beach posters, which was the most amazing gig ever, sailing from um, the East Coast to Bermuda. Uh, and I wasn't crazy about the cruising life, but if I were to take another cruise again, it would be a cruise through what is called the Inland Passage up from... Uh, Seattle, the Seattle area through to Alaska. These basically they're fjords. Um, and the Alaska Steamship Company began uh, during the Klondike Gold Rush in 1897. Uh, and they sailed up through these sheltered seas, which were the waterways surrounded by rock. Absolutely just a majestic uh, and beautiful uh, view. Uh, this may be the most well-known of all Alaskan travel posters for the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, by an artist named Sidney Lawrence, who was a painter, a very established painter in his own right. Um, this piece from like the early 1930s um, uh, is entitled Going to the Potlatch, uh, which is uh, in the Chinook jargon of the Northwest Coast. Uh, a potlatch is a festival of giving to which one's family members, family, neighbors, friends, or even whole tribes are summoned from far and near. 
So the thing about Sidney Lawrence is, and Angelina, I'm going to do something that I have never done during one of these presentations before. I'm going to step outside my comfort zone. Take a look at this picture here uh, that was used by the Northern Pacific Railway, uh, and then come with me on my tour to the Anchorage Art Museum, where they had the original painting on which this was based. And I took a picture of that, which is not quite posters in the wild, but you get an idea. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? And the, the um, it's not exactly the same. There's some added color and there's a, you'll see there's a ship in the background here, but obviously the uh, the idea is the same. And I, I, I can't help but throw in another holiday shot since I have you all captive here. Um, Sidney Lawrence did some ginormous paintings. That's actually in the museum as well. Uh, I show this as a sort of cheap ploy to impress upon you all that I'm wearing tartan even when I'm traveling. Uh, but that is that is a Sidney Lawrence painter a painting. He was known as the painter of light, uh, and his handling of the the shadows and the snow uh, was was truly masterful. This is another poster of his, less well known, uh, also for the Alaska steamship uh, line, circa 1930, coming up through the inland passages. You see, uh, a lot of other Alaskan posters are. I, I don't know if I'd say less serious, but perhaps more frolicsome. Uh, here you have a very happy young lass in a sort of elegant or at least elaborate uh, fur parka. Uh, notice in the background, the Northern lights are happening. Uh, I am very disappointed to say that when you go to Alaska in the summer and there's 20 hours of daylight, uh, it never gets dark enough for you to see the Northern lights, although this would have been the week to do it. Um, the sun sun went down at 11.30 p.m. and came up at four in the morning. So there was an awful lot of daylight. But here um, you get a few, you get the ice flows, you get the, the ice maiden, and you get the, the northern lights. Uh, we'll be coming, uh, talking more about Pan Am a little bit later, but I decided to put this in this section here. Uh, another um, image with a elegant, elaborate fur collar. And of course, a totem pole there in the background. Uh, I don't think any tribute to Alaska posters would be complete without uh, an image for the Iditarod. This is not the Iditarod. I think it's a, uh, a precursor, the All Alaska Dog Derby. Um, the first one was run in 1908. Uh, for this, uh, in 1941, the competition in Fairbanks consisted of a 165 mile round trip between Fairbanks and Living Good. Uh, hauling freight was part of the competition. That's what's shown here. Nico, we have a question in the chat. Do you know how to spell the previous artist's name? This artist? I think it came up right before that artist. That artist. Uh, I don't believe I have an artist associated with this. Let's see. Designer unknown. D-E-S-I-N-E-R. U-N-K-N-O-W-N, -N -N, designer unknown. Excellent. Um, no, there's no, there's no- Oh, attribute. Sydney, the Marine, the Marine artist. Ah, uh, Sydney Lawrence. Yes, Sydney Lawrence is S-Y-D-N-E-Y. He wasn't so much a Marine artist uh, as an Alaskan landscapist. S-Y-D-N-E-Y-L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E. Sydney Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, Pan Am did a lot of different styles of posters. Uh, this one is sort of a, uh, a photo montage. Um, that's the Alaskan flag there. Alaska did not become a state until 1959. Uh, the flag has the Big Dipper on it and then one star for the one state uh, above the lower 48. Uh, and then I believe I did show this in a different uh, presentation, but I'm going to show it again. This is from... I did. This is from a series of absolutely extraordinary and rather rare uh, Pan Am airway posters that was done by an artist named Mark von Arenberg in the 1950s. Very little is known about him. Uh, he was an illustrator. Um, and I, I, I marvel at the fact that so little was known about him because uh, it shows how sort of, no pun intended here, low on the totem pole illustrators were. Um, this image is great. It's got the, the landscape. It has some of the native heritage. Uh, I looked it up today. There are 228 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, um, which is just an incredible number. I, I 
the village to me looks like a northeastern fishing village, uh, but the rest of the piece is is pure uh, 49th state there. Just just wonderful. And Don, I'm going to stop with my Alaskan tour there. Pass it back to you for the next tranche. Great. Uh, are we going to be seeing? Did you see that uh, the last poster everybody had uh, Pan American Clipper in it? We're going to be talking a little bit about that later with cocktails. I don't know if you're going to go back to that, Nico, but okay. uh, right. our next uh, cocktail is all the way across the country back in small town in Massachusetts named Cape Cod, uh, known for, among other things, uh, Cranberry Box. And it's why the ever popular cranberry vodka cranberry cocktail is also known as a Cape Cotter. So we're going to make a variation of that today. Um, some recipes call for squeezing a lime wedge over the glass and dropping it in. I've never done that. So I'm going to actually do that now. It, this is one of those drinks that uh, like when I was in college, everybody drank them. And it's one of the few drinks that everybody drank when I was in college that is actually a pretty good drink. So going to build it in a highball glass, get a lime wedge if you want to. Squeeze that and drop it in. This way it's not it's just going to get the juice, it's also going to get the oils from the peel. Then we're going to add an ounce and a half of vodka. Uh, people always ask me what I prefer. Um, I tend to actually really like, like Stoli or just vodka. It's a really good vodka. Uh, rarely inexpensive. Vodka should not be expensive. I tend to think you're paying for the bottles. Um, but I had this uh, leftover buried in my fridge from years ago, so I'm going to use this one. And an ounce and a half. There we go. And then we're going to fill this with ice. It's a really simple drink. If you're doing this and you're using uh, orange juice, you have a screwdriver. Then getting really good fresh tart cranberry juices is not all that easy right now. Uh, but they did have uh, ocean spray cranberry, which you're going to find pretty much in any bar. That's what they're going to use. So I'm going to use that too. And we're going to fill this. And what I like to do is just give it a little bit of a stir, help dilute it, help mix the vodka. And uh, I think my straw fell off my table. <laughs> but you can use a straw. You just drink it like this. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a Cape Cotter vodka cranberry cocktail. Really extremely simple. It's probably the simplest cocktail I think I've ever made on this show. So you must know, is go. that cranberry juice sweetened or unsweetened, Don? Oh, this one is unsweetened. Yeah. Unsweetened. So cheers. And I know that was a short one, but hope you're ready, Nico. We're gonna go back to you. Uh thank you. A quick shout out to Ariel. I think she's watching. She was in Alaska also. She saw a couple of moose also. There's another shot. Um Speaking of short ones, um, this is going to be my shortest segment. You have two more cocktails to make, Don. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, okay, good. I only have one more trucker hat, though. So. All right. Well, your grandfather had a very small wardrobe. What can I tell you? Uh, so, there are like 50 in the closet, but yeah. Uh, so we are going to move on. Let me see if I share my screen here. We're going to go on to the Cape Cod area now. And... Um, I have a, a, a yapping dog here. I'm going to try and corral. Come here, All right. So the interesting thing about Cape Cod is that uh, it's a very large area, and there were not a tremendous number of posters that were done to advertise Cape Cod specifically. So I've taken a little bit of a poetic poster license. Um, this is the, the uh, most prominent Cape Cod poster by an artist named Ben Nason. Uh, Nason designed posters for the New Haven Railroad, um, and one of the main destinations used to be Cape Cod. The railroad no longer runs out there, as far as I know, 
Uh, you can fly there now to Hyannisport or to Martha's Vineyard, but you can't take the train anymore. But this just sort of this sort of captures uh, the classic New England village with with the lighthouse there. You get half half the poster is a starry night, uh, half the poster is the bright uh, summer day. Really a good image. The majority of pieces that actually uh, promote Cape Cod itself by name are poster maps. I think Angelina's favorite of all. Um, said they so are maps. They're not poster maps. Moose. Oh, um, Anyway, this one here is from uh, circa 1940. You sort of get a full sweep of Cape Cod. You've got Nantucket Sound, Cape Cod Bay, uh, all the way to the north. You have Provincetown. Curiously, uh, there were no travel posters that I could find uh, in the sort of pre-1950s era having to do with Provincetown at all, which I thought was a bit surprising. But these kind of illustrated maps, if you see along the borders, uh, along the bottom border, you have little um, pictures of fish. On the top, you have pictures of boats. And on the left, you have different sports activities. There's fishing and archery, baseball, golf, uh, and it's like water skiing there as well. Really kind of fun. Uh, this is another map, circa 1937. Pretty much the same thing, except here the decorative borders are buoys uh, and seagulls on the top. It's actually quite well accomplished that way with, with the sort of the decorative ropes. And on the bottom, you have that sort of classic New England town again, uh, except for the windmill. I guess I don't know enough about Cape Cod to know if there are actually windmills there, but you do see a church, you do see the lighthouse. Those are all very clearly uh, Cape Cod sort of st st stalwarts. Uh, this map of Cape Cod from 1930 uh, is just three colors. Again, it has all of those features, uh, the decorative border with fish and wildlife, um, all the little vignettes. I, I couldn't get a, a high enough resolution picture for you to see all the different vignettes. But that's why people love these poster maps, Angelina, because the vignettes uh, are- so We even have somebody in the chat saying it's an illustrated map, Nico. It's an illustrated well, obviously, map. Obviously, it's a friend of yours and you're poisoning the pool. But um, with, with all due respect to the person who said that, Moose. So I have to say Moose. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another great Cape Cod map here. Call it an illustrated map. Call it a poster map. Uh, it is a map of Cape Cod. Uh, the inset there with, with the birds. And again, you can't quite see the details, but you get the idea. Uh, Cape Cod is much larger than just, obviously, Cape Cod itself. And so I did think outside the box. This is also Ben Nason, whose poster we saw at the top for Cape Cod. This is for Nantucket uh, from the same series he did for the New Haven Railroad, sort of the sort of lovely colonial view with this old fashioned house and the horse and buggy and the cobblestone streets uh, and the boats in the, um, in the harbor. Uh, ben Nason again, I think this one showed up in a previous uh, talk as well, circa 1960. It says Cape Cod on it. That's my excuse. Um, Massachusetts year-round year, year vacation land. Although it's the same artist, Ben Nason, this one wasn't done for the railway. This was done for the Massachusetts Department of Commerce. So it's basically like a, a general general publicity map. Come come and see. Oh, I think, do I, oh, there we go. And then the final piece uh, for, for this series, so I told you it was quick. This one also showed up in a previous uh, presentation. This really is one of my favorite posters. It's by another prominent illustrator named John Held Jr. Uh, it's from 1932. Um, and posters were sort of the origin of posters largely surrounded the train industry uh, in France when train companies were printing posters to encourage people to buy tickets on their trains to travel to places. Uh, and they use destinations, they used fashion, uh, they use all sorts of different advertising conceits to put people in their trains. This is the most unique conceit I can imagine, which is ride a train and see a total eclipse of the sun taking place Wednesday, August 31st, 1932. Uh, it is the New Haven Railroad, uh, much like the work, uh, the pieces that, uh, that Ben Nason did. Uh, but here, I mean, I put Cape Cod in because you can't quite see that blue stripe down the uh, diagonal stripe is the path of the eclipse. 
uh, and you could see it in Cape Cod on August 31st, 1932. So technically, uh, this is also a Cape Cod poster. And I am going to end this segment there, Don, and let you go on to the next. Great. Thank you, Nika. Uh, that's actually kind of important, uh, talking about the train posters, because that's going to involve our next cocktail. And I, I love that you had one by John Held. He was also uh, an illustrator for uh, book covers as well. I think he did the Jazz Age. Um, our next cocktail is, is a bit of a conundrum, because... I thought, oh, trains, what, what is the most famous cocktail named after a train? Well, let's do that. And the more research I did, uh, the more people I found that said, oh, this cocktail, the 20th century, is named after the 20th century limited. <clears throat> Except everywhere I read, uh, it was more of a, um, a modern take on it. And it struck me as odd because, of all things, it's a, it's a British cocktail named after an American train. So... Everywhere I searched claims that it was named after the 20th Century Limited, which was an express train between uh, New York City and Chicago from 1902 to 1967, quite a long time. Uh, it was the New York Central Railroad's flagship train and one of the most famous in the world. But I, I actually have my doubts that this is directly named after the train. <clears throat> it seems odd that it's a cocktail from London, first mentioned in, in this, W.J. Tarling's uh, Cafe, Royal Cook, uh, Cafe Royal Cocktail Book, um, published in England in 1937. Uh, that is, it would, why would you name it after a 35 year old train, no matter how famous the train is? So I thought maybe, maybe there was press at the time because uh, the next year, 1938, it was totally revamped. It got uh, the 20th century limit, it was a uh, beautiful Art Deco train. That's the one people think of today. Um, but I think that would have been news to bartenders in New York and Chicago and not. Um, Charles A. Tuck, who's the guy who, who created this, he was at the time, I think, at the, the Buttery Bar at Hyde Park uh, Hotel in London at the time. But there was a 1932 Broadway play, a romantic comedy that takes place on a fictional version of the 20th Century Limited. And then a Howard Hawks movie was made two years later in 1934. So it's much more likely that Mr. Tuck in London saw a movie that was based on the play that was based on the train. Anyway, that's that's my guess. Um, we're gonna we're gonna make one now. Um, by the way, Mr. Tuck actually wrote his own book 30 years later in 67 called Cocktails and Mixed Drinks, in which um oh, I need this. Oh, actually I did this. Sorry. Uh, he wrote fill up a, a cocktail shaker with large ice cubes. Uh, pour and combine all the ingredients in an ice-filled shaker. Shake thoroughly for 15 to 18 seconds uh, until it's chilled and put in a pre-chilled glass. We're going to not fill it up with ice first. We're going to fill it up with the ingredients first. So we're going to go back to their gin. I'm going to go back to the Dorothy Parker since it happens to be here on my table. And I like it. So an ounce and a half of gin. Whatever your favorite gin for mixing is. And now a half ounce of Lillet Blanc. Um, some people substitute Cochi Americano because at the time this was made, uh, Lillet Blanc tasted a little bit different than uh, the modern Lillet, or Lillet tasted different than our modern Lillet Blanc. So I'm gonna use Lillet Blanc because I have it and it's tasty. So half an ounce of that. I haven't made one of these in a long time. And then, you're gonna use also a half an ounce of creme de cacao, which is basically uh, a cough, uh, chocolate flavored liqueur, re real simple one. Um, they make dark and light, I'm using light because it makes it uh, look pretty. So a half an ounce of that. Then three quarters ounce fresh lemon juice. I juiced some lemons earlier. Usually I show you how to juice things. I'll show you with a lime later. Um, but I have some fresh lemon juice that I just juiced like an hour ago. So three quarters of an ounce of that. Then add the ice. That was a little noisy. Fill it up. 
And then take our tin and shake it. Oh, he says to uh, 15 to 18 seconds, do it until you get some frost on the outside. Okay, then we're gonna put it in a glass, whatever fancy glass you have around. There we go. And this also you're going to be garnishing with a lemon peel. And uh, let's see, I moved my uh, peeler somewhere else. I'm gonna use a knife. There we go. Just got a nice wide swath. Express it over. You just want the oils. The garnish makes it look nice, but I, I tend not to use it for this one. And mm, that's quite a lovely, well-balanced cocktail. And there you go, the 20th Century Limited. Everyone says it's named after the express train. I think it's named after the movie that's named after the play that's named after the express train. Cheers. Cheers. That was great, Don. So this is weird. Can you hear me, Angelina? I can hear you. I can't hear you guys at all. Somehow I lost all volume on my computer. So I'm going to do this uh, deaf. Um, that's really weird, but I'll see, I'll see what happens. Thank you, Don. I couldn't actually hear the end of it, but I'm sure it's good. I heard the beginning, and I love the fact that some British guy made up a drink named after America's most favorite train. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really was one of the great trains. And I'm going to share my screen with you here now. All right. Uh, the 20th Century Limited, I mentioned this earlier. Um, we talked about the Chicago poster by Leslie Reagan. And this is Leslie Reagan's sort of piece de resistance, is the greatest poster. And arguably, in my mind, uh, not Angelina's. And the great thing about not being able to hear you, Angelina, is um, you can't argue with me. Oh, no. Uh, I think this is the best American Art Deco poster. It's certainly in the top uh, echelons, the top three or four. An incredible I would agree with him. 1939. Uh, this image actually appeared on a postage stamp. That's how famous it is, I guess, if that's a sign of fame. Um, just, just an incredible image. I love how the... Um, you can see the shadow of the train running uh, alongside the river and the, the frontispiece, uh, the, the logo on the front of the locomotive and just the sort of beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, shell, the, the outer fuselage word I've used before, uh, designed by Henry Dreyfus, really the pride of the New York Central Line. And it was such a proud um, part of their marketing that the image appeared in a lot of different places uh, most specifically on calendars. And this is a calendar uh, circa 1938. Obviously, it's the same train, almost in exactly the same depiction, but the background is different here. If you can't read what it says on the bottom, it says uh, the century in the highlands of the Hudson. So you've got sort of the rolling Hudson Valley there. Um, and the, the image was also used for, for wintertime images. This is a, and we call these calendar backs, and they're called calendar backs because you have to imagine a long calendar so the bottom half would be the pages of the months, and then the top half would be the image. Uh, most of the time, people buy the calendars and cut the calendars off the bottom, which uh, is not great, but that's how they do it. Uh, but you end up with these really wonderful images. And this is the 20th Century Limited uh, in the winter white, uh, in, in the winter water level route, which is what they called running uh, along the Hudson River. Um, We've used this at Swan Galleries for a Christmas card in years gone by, obviously a very seasonal specific image, but it was the 1945 New York Central System uh, poster. Wait, Nick, you can't hear me, right? Uh, then this image from 1943, uh, speeding through the heart of industrial America. Uh, I like this because you don't just see the locomotive here, you see some of the other cars in the train and you really get this wonderful juxtaposition of the engine uh, with the blast furnaces uh, in in the middle of the country. And again, all of these are by Leslie Reagan. And perhaps, and I don't know if this is true or not, perhaps Leslie Reagan's second most famous image uh, is this image from 1945, also a calendar back. Uh, every year, the railway had a different image to adorn their calendars. 
And here, uh, Reagan is depicting the LaSalle Street Station in Chicago. So arguably could have put this in the Chicago section. Uh, and the impressive fleet of engines run by the railroad. In the middle there is the iconic 20th Century Limited. Um, and then there's a steam train all the way on the left and, and a diesel train uh, second from the left. So sort of these great uh, depictions. And again, you see his treatment of clouds uh, with, the, with the skyscrapers, just, just magnificent. And the last of the 20th Century Limited posters that I wanna show you is this by another really famous artist named Sasha Maurer, whose work we have um, shown here before. This is uh, Take the New York Central to the New York World's Fair. Um, and here you have the 20th Century Limited arriving in New York into uh, the sort of the Grand Central complex with all of the buildings that were built above Grand Central Station. Uh, and then in the front right foreground, you have the Trilon and Perisphere, which were the signature structures of the exhibition. Um, really one of the great and, and one of the rare of the posters uh, that I've shown today. I've only known two copies of this uh, to have come off for auction in the last 30 years. So really good. And with that, I'm going to end. Don, I'm going to pass it back over to you uh, for the final tranche. Take it away. Nico, check the chat. You can't hear me. <laughs> but we could hear Nico. Yeah, we so. can hear Nico. Also, if you liked that uh, Deco train poster, it will be in the New York uh, exhibition we're doing in about a year's time. So oh. exciting things lay ahead. Well, if you remember, uh, Nico's last uh, poster of Alaska showed a Pan American Clipper. And that's the name of our next cocktail, the Pan American Clipper. So what is that? Uh, the Boeing 413 uh, Clipper it was an airplane. And it was a long range flying boat, meaning it could land on water, it could cross the Pacific, it could cross the Atlantic. And this is back in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, most of these planes were owned by Pan Am Airlines, and they were the way to travel overseas in, in luxury. So, of course, there's a cocktail named after that. Now, one world traveler, uh, an American author named Charles H. Baker, this guy here, um, he wrote about food and drink for various magazines. He was a, a bon vivant um, who drank with fellow authors Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner. I mean, that's the guy, the kind of guy this was. Uh, he had a flair for describing dishes and cocktails that he encountered from around the world. And he collected them in a two-volume set, which is very collectible. It's from 1939 called The Gentleman's Companion, uh, Being an Exotic Cookery and Drinking Book, or Around the World with Jigger, Beaker, and Flask. So volume one was food, volume two was drinks. And what I have is Jigger, Beaker, and Flask. It's the uh, reprint of volume two. Now, he retired to Florida, uh, where Pan Am opened their first international airport. And Baker is actually popular today because uh, happens to be a friend of mine, author, bartender, and restaurateur, Sinjin Frizzell, uh, revived leg the legacy of Baker by putting his cocktails in the menu at his bars. If you go to Brooklyn, go to uh, Fort Defiance or go to uh, Sunken Harbor and just open another Sunken Harbor in Bermuda. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to quick juice a lime. So I've got a lime that I cut in half from earlier. And we do not need much of this. It's going to be uh, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. So I'm going to just press it. There's one and a half. And I'm doing this just into a uh, Pyrex container. There we go. So I'm uh, going to do this. In a cocktail shaker, here we go, the Boston shaker. So starting with uh, two ounces of Calvados or apple brandy. Now he mentions Calvados, but he says if it's apple brandy, it's even better. I've got uh, Laird's straight apple brandy. Uh, St. John splits the base between bonded apple brandy like this and Jersey Lightning, which is a little raw. It's an unaged uh, apple brandy. So we're gonna do two ounces. My jigger is right here, okay, great. One, two. Ah, I do love apple brandy. Then three quarters an ounce of lime juice. Now let me measure this out. And what I'm gonna do is measure 
three quarters of an ounce. And then I'm gonna strain it just to make sure there's no pulp. There we go. Lastly, actually not lastly, penultimately, penultimately. Uh, it says half an ounce of grenadine. Now I've talked about grenadine before. Um, I prefer not store-bought grenadine. If you have it, that's okay. You can use it. Uh, but fresh grenadine, real grenadine, is really easy to make. It's pomegranate juice and sugar. Different recipes online. I generally use equal amounts. Just simmer them down, and that's it. Um, for myself, I add a little orange flower water and a little bit of pomegranate molasses. But pomegranate simple syrup. That's that's all grenadine is, and really cheap to make, fast to make, five minutes, and is just terrific. So I'm gonna do a half an ounce of that. Now we also have a question in the chat, yes. what is Calvados and how does it differ from apple brandy? Calvados is basically a French apple brandy. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and um, I am not exactly sure, but I think they are allowed to have uh, pears in it as well. I'd have to double check on that. But I, I think, of, and also French apples are different apples than what uh, we would get in New York and New Jersey for our apple brandy. Uh, by the way, the one I'm using here, Laird's, is I think the oldest distillery uh, still operating and is family owned uh, in the United States and it's in New Jersey. So quite tasty. They, they make a few different kinds of apple brandy. Oh, and lastly, a dash of absinthe. Now I'm using, uh, this is sadly New York State absinthe that is no more the distillery closed, um, but it is a rouge, meaning that it is, has a little bit of flavoring and coloring from hibiscus flowers, but it does have the scent of the uh, anise fennel in the wormwood, more of the anise in the fennel. And we're just gonna add a dash. So uh, I don't have my bar spoon here, but I'll use it. Yes. okay. Put a little bit in. Some people tend to rinse glasses. I actually like absinthe. I love the taste of it. So a little bit of absinthe. So there we go. We got um, apple brandy. We've got our fresh lime juice. We've got our grenadine. We've got our absinthe. I'm going to fill this with some ice. During the last segment, I went and got some new fresh ice cubes. Okay, there we go. Get a glass. It says uh, some recipes say put it into a Manhattan glass. I've got a nice uh, cocktail coop. Cocktail glass. Right. Now if you can see it getting a little bit of frosty there. Okay. Okay. Now, I tend to like it like this. Some recipes say that you should garnish it with a, um, oops, I'm stuck in there. Garnish it with a lime wheel. Um, so why not? Let's do that. We'll garnish it with a lime wheel. I have also seen these uh, made with um, dehydrated lime uh, peel, uh, lime wheel just resting on the top. So rather than Put it on the side. I'm going to do that. I'm just going to have it floating on the top. Looks pretty and smells really great. Cheers. Wish I had the ingredients for that. Mm. Nico, did you win your volume back? I uh, did. It's funny. It's funny what a mute button will do. Oh, uh, you muted yourself. It was disguised. It was disguised as something far ah. more complicated. Got it. Well, cheers to uh, having a Pan American Clipper when you can. That looks back great. To you. It's really funny. The um, my my mute button was disguised as a moose. <laughs> I hate you so much. All right, <laughs> um, love you, mean it. And now for the final segment here, uh, we are going to go to uh, Pan American Clipper. Yay! And, um, we already showed one Pan American Clipper, and to be very frank with you, this first piece I'm going to show you is not. Pan American Clipper, it's Pan Am. Uh, I love this poster. It is the height of camp from 1959. It's just Pan American to USA. This, folks, is how the rest of the world 
seize America, at least in the pre-Trump era. Um, cowgirl, uh, all the smiles, and um, I don't know, it's just great. The whole thing, the whole thing is just wonderful. But now on to the Pan American Clipper. Um, this poster from uh, 1947, uh, and you'll see in almost all these posters that I'm showing you, uh, the the clipper is in in the image. You can see it with its bulbous nose. This is by Boris Artsy Bashev, uh, a Russian emigre uh, who was an illustrator, did a lot of magazine illustrations and covers. He worked for Time, Life, and Fortune magazines. Um, Love this piece with sort of the mermaid hugging the island of Bermuda. It's it's a classic and, and sort of very much appreciated and sought after. Uh, this is a very well-known poster for Hawaii, but I bring it up just because it's by Clipper. There's the Clipper ship, uh, John Atherton, also an illustrator, um, much the same way that the Alaskan images had all of the sort of visual bells and whistles of Alaska. This has all the visual bells and whistles of Hawaii, the grass skirt, the lays, the pineapples, uh, that is um, Diamond Head in the background there off the beaches of Honolulu. So a great clipper. Uh, but the clippers weren't just, uh, the clipper posters weren't just advertising destinations. They were advertising the service as well. And I really love this uh, from 1951. Um, the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, for those who are airline geeks, was a modified version of two World War II bomber planes. Um, it was designed to compete with the Lockheed Constellation. It was a lumbering giant of an aircraft which lacked any sort of streamlined beauty. It had very little structural grace, but it had wonderful comfort and one comforts and wonderful amenities, uh, including a lounge and a full size uh, a, a lounge and a bar and full size bathrooms. I don't know what that means, but that's how they advertise it: full size bathrooms. Here you see the living room comfort. Um, and then the berths that are available on every strato clipper um, being tucked in by a stewardess. Somehow, I don't think that would fly in today's day and age. Uh, we've seen the work of Mark von Ehrenberg before. Did I show this poster before? I did. We're going to carry on. Another um, great clipper poster um, and very, very rare uh, flying into New York. This the French version of a poster that would have been printed in America. Um, the, the worst thing about this poster, and it really is a wonderful poster, the worst thing about this poster is that big banner of text that covers up the northern part of Manhattan. Uh, it's such a total disappointment. Wait, but the, te um, the poster exists in three variants because it's in the New York book we're in the middle of writing without yes, the additional text. It does. I think the American version has it without the text. Um, but this one, they, they, they screwed it up just in a grand way, like put tape put tape across the Mona Lisa's eyes. Like it just, it just doesn't work. Uh, another wonderful image uh, with the Strato Cruiser here uh, for Pan Am fly to New York. This is um, the famous statue uh, in front of Rockefeller Center by the um, artist Lee Laurie. Uh, the statue weighs two tons uh, and it's just a wonderful Art Deco um, image. And you've got the New York sort of skyscape there in the background and these, um, Mad Men era tourists taking pictures of the statue. I love this image. Uh, it doesn't actually have a clipper in it, uh, nor does it say clipper, but it's really a rare Pan Am image. Uh, travel to Houston uh, with an oil rig and a bucking Bronco and the cowboy uh, sort of uh, right in the middle of it. Uh, getting a little later on here, we're now at 1958. This is an artist named Aaron Fine. Uh, very comical, this, the um, the uh, French policeman and the, uh, the uh, guard, the British guard are looking up, all they see are the contrails. So you see that the clipper has already passed. Um, all sorts of different destinations were advertised along the Pan Am route here. Fly clipper to Africa. I think it's a wonderful image. You've got that very serious looking um, leopard there in the middle, surrounded by all sorts of scenes of wildlife hunting uh, and um, modern technology and native culture there. 
another one in the series by Aaron Berg, this just fly to America, all sorts of great American imagery with the Pan Am Clipper there on the left. Uh, you've got the cityscape in the background. You've got the great uh, redwoods of California and some of the hills of the national parks in the middle. Arenberg again, this series is just so rare. I never tire of the um, possibility of showing them off to Australia and New Zealand. You've got the koala bears, you've got the boats, you've got the exotic birds. Um, dates to circa 1947. Arenberg again, uh, this is the final poster I have, uh, fly to the Caribbean via Clipper. Uh, here is probably the most prominent Clipper aircraft in all of von Arenberg's posters but you do get that wonderful uh, Caribbean vibe with the parrots and the small towns and the inlets. I think that's even a little monkey there. Um, Non-indigenous to the Caribbean uh, and not seen in this poster are any moose whatsoever. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, <laughs> and with that, uh, I come to the end uh, of our uh, American travel posters, part do, part the second. I mean, I think you took a little liberty there by using the Clipper for like New Zealand as an American travel coaster. Just saying, I think it's a bit of a stretch. Honestly, um, I don't think it's a bit of a stretch. I think it's a huge stretch. Stretch. I was focusing more on Clipper than I was on American at that point. So there's also Africa, which is also not part of America, and London, also not part of America, mm -hmm. but they all were Clippers. So point point well taken. You went uh, cool. Um, I, we do have one question in the chat from Susan. She wants to know, where were these travel posters distributed? Uh, they were distributed to travel agencies around the world. So the train posters would have appeared on train platforms uh, in earlier days, and the airline posters would have appeared in travel agencies around the world, encouraging people to take exotic trips places. Excellent. Well, everyone, thank you sometimes, guys. Sometimes um, when you got north of the border, uh, it was not unknown for travel posters to be strapped to the back of moose. And so as they wandered around, people could see them. That happened. The screen chartreuse and gin is real rough, guys. I love uh, how you keep drinking it, though. Well, you keep saying <laughs> it. What? Which, which word? The word. You're not saying the word. Please don't say the word. Don't say the word. Um, uh, but anyway, thank you all so much. I'm very, I'm very pleased. I'm like the moose that ate the canary. Well, uh, next time um, I'll try to find a cocktail that has green chartreuse in it, and you can thank do that. You. Thank you. I mean, I mean, despite my endless bar, right? My ingredients are limited. Um, but anyway, the topic for tonight was actually crowdsourced. So, if you guys have any other suggestions for future posters and cocktails or cocktail themes, now is the time to let us know. You can also email info at posterhouse.org at any time to give us your ideas for what you think a great theme would be. Uh, and I think we actually have enough in it in us with the America stuff to do a part trois. A menage a trois of cocktails, if you will. Um, and we will be announcing future posters and cocktails events soon. Salvador is going to be talking to me about that in the next few weeks. And yes, we are hoping to bring at least one of them live and in person this fall. Um, and definitely e email us with any thoughts on that, if you're a local or not, and you would like to come. Uh, and if you're in the city, please remember to stop by Poster House to see our incredible exhibitions before they close, attend an event at the Green Fairy Society, or preview the upcoming poster auction at Swan Auction Galleries, where you will also get the pleasure of interacting with one or all of us. Um, and with that, Good night, everybody. <laughs>